Cool. All right. So um, it's, it's an interesting one because this week I've received about three pitch decks, which is always, uh, it's always a good one to, to, it's a good scenario to be able to have my head in the space uh, just before, before giving a, a chat on it. So just to give you a bit of a background on my experience with pitch decks. Um, so in the past, I've obviously raised, oh, Frank, uh, we've been raising money. So one of the very first uh, startups I was working at, we, uh, this was, this was amazing. They raised $12 million without a pitch deck. So they actually raised it on a brochure. So this is like 2012. They went around to the different um, investors and actually started raise, and raised that. And then we raised another 35 million. And I've got that pitch deck uh, here with me as well. But that's a little bit more involved. And that's a 52 page slide. But as you can imagine, when you're raising that kind of money, it was a long series of conversations. Uh, and then uh, since then, I've been either invested in a number of different companies or we've been um, raising money for a, a bunch of different companies. And so what I'd like to do is just take a little bit of learning from what I've seen out on the ground, talking to other investors, what I see coming through my inbox. Uh, and just to give you some examples of what I, you know, what I know works and what I know turns the investors off and what, you know, I see the kind of common mistakes that I see that startup founders make. Um, and you can see it like no matter where you are in the world, people seem to be making the same kinds of mistakes. So what I wanted to touch on firstly is what is the purpose of a pitch deck? And I know that it sounds very obvious that you're using it to raise money, but a lot of people will assume that the pitch deck is a thing that's going to get them the cash, right? And it's not, it's a thing that gets you the foot in the door. So, and it's a tool that you can use for many different things going forward. So for example, uh, and I'll give you an example of one of the companies we launched a few years back called Avrium. You know, we, we created our pitch deck and, and actually we multipurpose that pitch deck for partners, um, other kind of consumers or other stakeholders we had within the organization. So the one thing to look at it is it's a, it's a marketing tool, obviously a way that you can engage with investors. It needs to tell a story. So it needs to provide some narrative as to what you're doing, why you're doing it, why you think you're great at doing it and where you see yourself uh, going to be. Uh, it also needs to be very up to date. So you often see, well, I've come across pitch decks which aren't up to date. So they don't have the, the current financials or when they may be talking about the story, if they do that, uh, they're talking about things that have happened in the past and not really what's going on at, at this moment in time. And what you're really trying to do is set the stage for your vision, right? So if you imagine that you're sitting like myself, you get a whole bunch of different things going through your inbox. Um, and especially if you're talking to angel investors who may be busy with their own day jobs or investment as a side activity, when they are looking to, when they're looking at a pitch deck, when they're looking to, to see something in front of them, they want that thing that's going to catch their eye. And they want that thing that is going to tell them quite quickly whether they should be investing or not. So, in the points I've had said to, to keep in mind, you know, it doesn't have to be war and peace. And I think this is one of the ones that I see again, quite often you get 30, 40 page slide decks and you know, most investors don't have time for that. They'll have time for it once they are able to, you know, once they've decided this is something they, they want to um, invest in, then they will spend some time reading it. But if you send someone something that's 30 pages and if you haven't really sparked their interest within the first couple of slides, you're not going to get, they're not going to get past that because they'll receive hundreds or I mean, I, I'm not even a, an institutional investor and I'm receiving like five, six a week, which is a lot really. Um, and I, unless I see straight away what it is and I understand the business very quickly, I'm not really going to engage. The other big thing uh, is that you need to make sure, you know, you live your, you live and breathe your company, right? And you know, you're doing it in and out every day. You're you're dealing with your customers, your suppliers, you're dealing with your own uh, stakeholders. If you've got any angel investors, you're dealing with those straight away. And you're talking your business every day. You're talking in your language, uh, but investors aren't, right? So you may go to investors who are actually, uh, have previously invested in your, in your industry, but don't assume that everyone knows everything that you're, um, that you're talking about. So things like acronyms, and we'll, we'll go into that in detail a bit further down, but make sure that you are, explaining everything in a way that is easy to digest. Now, I, I always like to think of pitch decks as something that I would present to a board. So I don't know if you guys have done many, many board level presentations, right? But if you're talking to a board and you've got like five, five, 10 minutes to, to present something in front of the board, it's got to be, it's got to look decent. Um, I've always realized visuals are something that need to be there. So if, I guess the further up the food chain you go, the more you react to things like children. So if there's not lots of nice colors, lots of nice pictures, 
you, it doesn't grab your attention. You're not really going to look at it. If you have lots and lots of text, people get bored very quickly and they're not really going to engage with that. So I always like to think of it as, you know, I used to say to, um, to one of my friends, it was like a Tonka toy presentation. So it's got to look like a toy, it's bright and shiny and something I want to touch and feel and, uh, and do stuff with. So you, you've got to make sure that it is there and easy to read and easy to consume. And also don't forget to tailor your pitch deck, right? It doesn't need, you don't need to have just one all purpose pitch deck for, for everybody. If you're talking to specific investors and you know that they've got either a history of investing in a certain uh, area or certain sets of companies, relate that to them, make it something that they can connect with. And there's no harm in doing that. So what slides do you need? Now, again, there are, um, there's obviously a lot of content out there about pitch decks and how you should create them and what should be in them. And at the end of this presentation, I've listed four resources that show, um, that are kind of consistent, I guess, with what I'm thinking, but they are the, you know, the, the Guy Kawasaki uh, methodology. There's a, a couple of other uh, links in there where there's interviews with VCs. And actually, I read through those uh, just the other day, and it, and it does they do fit in with what I'm I'm trying to say through this um, this presentation. And and again, this these sets of slides that I'm coming up with and I'm talking about here are a something that I would like to see when I'm looking at pitch decks. But this is also the feedback that I've gotten back from investors when I've been pitching to them. So the very first thing is an executive summary, and this is what I don't see a lot of. Right, I don't get when you are pitching something the very first thing you should see is what your vision is right i should be able to know very quickly what this thing is about what is your product what's your vision what are what are you trying to do and some investors like it some don't but a lot of them want you to be upfront with what you're asking for right so if you're asking for half a million you're asking for two million just ask for it right because most people have it right at the end but there's no real need for you to have it at the end of your pitch deck. You can say, I'm, we're trying to raise X amount of money uh, for this vision. Now, like I said, it's a, I put it down as optional because some people like to do it. They don't, you know, they don't feel it comfortable doing it. I personally say, get the bad news out of the way first, because once you've got out of the way, then people can start thinking and deciding whether what you've put down as your, as your number is really that number. And that's, then you can have that conversation at the end once they've understood what it is that you're doing. Uh, and I think that's, you know, it's, it, 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 it helps really filter, it helps with someone who's looking at lots of different pitch decks with lots of people who want different type, amounts of money for different things. If you they know quite quickly, they can help you because it's the right amount of money for them. Yes, then that's great. If they know it's too much or maybe it's too little because it's too much due diligence um, for a small amount of money, then you can get a no quickly. And, and what you're trying to get to is no quickly, ultimately, right? You want to know, you don't, the last thing that you want as a, as a person seeking funding is to be strung along because raising investment is hard. It takes a long time. You have to talk to a lot of people and you would rather get those people who you know aren't interested out of the way quickly. And that's you know, something that if you've been through this before, you'll, you'll understand that you need to get to that know quickly and, and try and dig, you know, sift through to the people who want to actually invest in you. So the next thing is the, the problem definition, right? So it sounds pretty obvious, but really what are you trying to, what problem are you trying to solve and why is it a problem? Because a lot of times people will believe something is a problem, but actually you're not, you know, you're not expressing it in a way that seems to me that it's a problem. Uh, and at this point in time, you want to show how big this problem is and how many people it affects and what really can you, what would, why is this such an issue that needs to be solved? And if you can do that and really present this in a way that this is a uh, this is a, a an opportunity, there's an opportunity here with a very big market share with a baby a global presence because a lot of the investors that I talk to, you know, they understand that you're going to start small and start locally, but they'll want to know that this thing can scale, and that the set, the problem that you're addressing is a problem that can be tackled in multiple markets. Because if they are looking for a bigger exit or they're looking for certain multiples, they'll need to know that the, those multiples exist. Uh, in the market and the problem that you're trying to solve. And even if it's a niche one, right? Even if it's a situation where you've created a very niche product that can, that you've only got a, a, um, a set number of people who will be able to, to, uh, who, who's set number of people whose problem you're trying to resolve. That's not necessarily an issue either, because if you can solve that problem fully and capture more of the market, that is also, um, that is also something that's, that's very interesting. And when you move into the solution, so when you're describing what it is that you're, uh, how you're solving it, you can also start looking at other ways. So the, the problem that's there, 
that you're looking to tackle, you can take the solution and then maybe that solution can be taken to other markets as well. So it may be that for a single thing that now, the single market that you're, uh, that you're able to tackle, maybe as you go through the solution, you realize that actually there are other, other similar markets that have similar problems that making a small tweak can then allow that solution uh, to work for those markets. And that's where, again, you've got to spark some imagination, right? So when we're looking at defining the solution, uh, de defining a solution, you're, you're basically saying, what, what am I doing differently? What value am I bringing to the market? And how am I really solving this problem? Do I actually address that problem that I've highlighted or is it, am I somehow addressing something else? Um, and so a, a lot of the times people will state a problem and then they'll present a solution and you'll look at that solution and saying, well, it doesn't really fully address that problem. Uh, and so what you need to do is really show that a that you're addressing the problem that you've shown and b that there is more than that solution so you, you want to give them a little bit of a uh, tantalize them up to a certain point right where you're saying yes i've solved this problem and the, on the offshoot of that there may be additional things that might come out of it so a lot of the play over the last few years has been around data so where you're you, you're out there um, solving a certain problem, but the offshoot of, of solving that problem is you can collect and gather a lot of data and that data then can be used either to enhance your solution or it can be used to enter into other markets and solve a slightly different problem out there. So this is, it's really that solution is the beginning. You've got your product, you'll showcase that, you'll give the slides of showing the slides of, um, you know, what you've done, the MVP you've created or the mock-ups or whatever it is that you, you've got, but you're also looking to say, well, there's also maybe something else in there because it's all about a dream that you're selling, right? So once you've stated, you know, what is your vision? What's the problem? What is the uh, solution? Then you need to go a little bit more deeper into the, into the actual market. So as I say on the slides here, how big is that market? And how, what, and you need to be realistic here, right? So you, a lot of people come and say, yes, especially in the B2C market or even some of the B2B markets, I can take all of the market share here, right? I'm, my solution is good for all of the consumers, but it's not, right? investors aren't stupid. They know that you're not going to get a hundred percent of the share. So the, what they want to see is have you analyzed the market in such a way that you know the depth of that market and actually know your place within that market. So does it seem realistic to them that the solution that you've got, can it a address the problem, but B address the problem for those people that you say it can be addressed for. And then is that market big enough so that if I invest in this company, I'm going to get some growth and return from that. If, as you guys will be more uh, knowledgeable about your market than any, anybody else, you can, you know, you should be able to quite safely say how the market will look in an X number of years time. Will there be much growth in this market or do you feel it's changing? Will other competitors that are actually in the market changing anything? A bit of analysis around that is always good because as I said at the beginning, you don't always want to assume that the person reading it is going to know huge amounts about the market that you're, you're actually trying to address. So, if there are any trends or any, any kind of um, changes that you're seeing in the market that may be happening at this moment in time and, and you're trying to ride that wave, then definitely put that all in, try and capture all that. And I realize that I'm saying a lot and, you, and I'm trying to tell you to put it all in a very small amount of slides, but I'll show you some examples that do it, that do it quite well. Um, then we're looking at the business model, right? So that everyone wants to know how you're actually going to make money. And again, this is weirdly something that people don't tend to put in. Uh, they tend to put in the financial projections. So they'll give you the hockey stick graph of, yeah, I'm going to make millions in the next, uh, next, next year, but they don't really tell you how you're going to do that. Uh, and how can that business model scale? And what happens if certain issues arise? how would you get around those in the business model? So for example, if you're a subscription based thing, what happens if someone comes in and then undercuts you on price, does that kill your business model? Are there additional value added services that you can add in to bolster your pricing? Um, are there other, you know, are there additional services you can offer, et cetera. So one of the things you'll be looking at is compared to your, the problem size, the market is your business model attractive. So are you selling whatever your solution is at the right price? Are you selling it to the right people in the market? And are, will those people, um, will those people continue to keep buying if it's uh, e-commerce in, in your um, for your company, Nancy? Will they keep buying? Is there going to be repeat business? How can we get more out of the the customers that are there? 
so you, you also want to talk a little bit about customer retention and, and how do you retain what's the average you know revenue um, the, the recurring revenue for a for a customer lifetime value for a customer all these kinds of things are things that you should have and you'll put the figures down further in the financial plan but these are the things that you need to understand um, and are you look at are you a high churn uh, business is it something where your people are buying once and not really returning or are you something that's quite sticky and then people will will use once they've got that solution and then are there other th bits as i mentioned before are there a other problems you can solve with that solution or are there complementary additions to your business model that might be able to help um, increase your revenue so typical examples are say in the in the in the fintech space right where you've got people who are making it easier to to see your spend and then that able allows you to then to switch switch plans so for example you've got uh, fintechs in the uk where you're able to um show you know show your bank accounts and then use those to to save a certain amount of money per month into into funds or etfs or whatever it is similarly they may be able to show your over, overall spend on things like uh, certain types of insurance and then are selling you insurance solutions so your initial business may be a subscription model but are there complementary services that you can add to your business model to enhance it so these are all the things that you know an investor is going to be looking at to understand what's the potential for this company that i'm putting some money in then you're looking at the go-to-market plan which is obviously it's all about execution so i think if you talk to most investors right they'll they'll know after having invested in many many businesses over time that the rate of failure for startups is is very high so it's all about your ability to execute and again one of the things i don't see very often in uh, investor decks is a coherent go-to-market plan like how are you going you've got you know your market uh, you know the problem how you're going and getting that market and if you remember what we talked about in the business model canvas you know what are the partners that you're using what collaborators are you using to get in get to that to get to that market are you going directly to your consumers are you using other channels uh, how are you going to ensure that the financials that you're going to show on the next few slides are achievable? And is it realistic? And that's where I think a lot of it is, um, you know, you, you see people aren't very, they don't have much detail in how they're going to market. So they'll say, yes, we're going to do, uh, we're going to do a campaign to get X amount of, of customers. Right. But have you done a trial run of that campaign? How do you know that, putting that money in is actually going to get you the money back. What have you done to test the market? What have you done to actually show that if I just put steroids behind this, this plan action plan, I'm going to uh, get the results that I want. And then on top of that, what happens if something is, is going to go wrong, right? If, if it doesn't go, go as I expect it to, what am I going to do in order to, to, to try and make up the loss that I've made? So for example, let's say you go for a campaign and you're going to get hundred customers and you get 50, What's your game plan then? What are you going to do? Are, you, are there other avenues for you to get that other 50? Or if you're in a market where you know that the sales cycle is, is long. So a good, an interesting one is the whiskey market, right? And that sounds a bit random tangent. But you know, anyone who's starting a brewery knows that it takes five, 10 years to, to distill your whiskey, your whiskey. So that's why they all make gin, because gin can be done very quickly. So you're putting millions and millions of pounds into creating a distillery you're not going to sit there for 20 years waiting for your money to come back. Right. You want to know that you can actually do something else with it. So it, it's, it's stuff like that. It sounds obvious, but actually a lot of people don't really put that into their, into the go to market plan. The other thing actually is one, one question I got, which is a while back, which was really intriguing for me was I was in a meeting and someone said to me, well, if I gave you double the money, would you go twice as fast? Right. Because if I want my return quicker, if I want to give you more money, would you, would you, would you just hire, twice as many people and and actually um and get done and i was like it, it was something that made me think because actually no not all the time right you're not it's not always the case that if you put more money behind it you're going to be able to um to to get the results quicker so when you're being when you're talking to the investors and you're you know putting the, the pitch deck in front of them these are the questions you might be able to ask but if you've not got a great go-to-market plan to understand that in, in and inside out you won't be able to answer those questions so we've talked about the market analysis. You've talked about your business model. You've talked about your go-to-market strategy, right? One of the best things is showing what your competitors have done. So have you got any competitors? What have they done based on the problem that you're trying to solve, your solution, the market analysis, and the, um, 
and the go-to-market strategy, out of those, what have your competitors been doing, right? What have they been doing? And are you picking any of their good practices out? Are you targeting the same kinds of uh, customers? If you are, okay, fine. How, you know, how, do you, how, do you, uh, how do you expect to get market share from them? What, mistake, what have you learned from their mistakes? How are you going to be able to succeed where they may not necessarily have succeeded? Or how are you going to outperform someone who is already performing well? Right. Uh, what is your key differentiator? Because again, this is a, a really back down to your go-to-market strategy, right? If you've got uh, an industry or you're going into a market that is very competitive, you've got to figure out how you're going to have to st- how you're going to stand out anyway, right? You're going to have to figure out you're not only your product market fit, but you're also going to have to understand your go-to-market and have that um, and be able to kind of talk about your business in a way that differentiates yourself, right? Are you are you pricing yourself <clears throat> above your competitor? Are you pricing yourself as a luxury brand? Are you pricing yourself as a cheap alternative, right? And how does that then sustain into your business model and then the market size for that? Because then all of this comes together. It's all, it's all very cohesive, right? It's, it, as throughout this entire deck, what you want to be doing is telling that story and telling your story. And what you want to be doing is showing that this thread of the vision that you've started, you've understood how that vision dots through all of these different uh, pieces, these items, so that you're creating a coherent story that if anyone questions, well, you can have an answer for, right? So it, it, it's saying, and competitors are a great one because a lot of companies will, a lot of investors will see competitors and, they, and they'll just say, well, these guys are doing better, so I don't believe you can do it, right? And, and, and actually where you'll differentiate yourself, maybe you'll go to market strategy. You might be going through channels. You might not be tackling exactly the same set of customers that they're, they're tackling. And so you've got to figure out how do you stand out? Because those guys, are, if they're already running, an investor will say, well, why don't I put my money and just buy shares in that business if it's, if it's already IPO'd? So you've got to have that answer to that question. And, and obviously you believe in yourself and you, and you feel that you're better. So why are you better? And make it visual, right? Show why you're better. Now, the one thing I realized on the financial model um, is that I haven't actually uh, put in what are you going to use the money for slide. Uh, so, but it's something that, you know, what, what you'll want to do, and you might want to combine it with the financial model, you might want to have it as a separate, but you do d- need to have that in, uh, in this deck. And I can, I can adjust this and, and resend it. But really your financial model, everyone knows, if you're a pre-revenue startup, everyone knows that your numbers are just made up right? No one is going to sit there and expect you to to hold that. But what they want to know is if you've thought about the numbers in a sensible way. So if if you come up with a graph that says that you're making zero this year, 500 quid next year, and then 2 million the next year, people are going to want to know how that is actually going to come with my half a million pound investment. So really what you're looking to do here is to show that you've thought about all of the different aspects of your financial model. You don't have to show them, right? So it's not necessarily that you have to show all of your working out, but you want to show the key, key measures, right? So you want to obviously uh, revenue, EBITDA, uh, number of customers, average revenue per customer, all of these different things. What are your cost base is, where are your main costs going? Uh, are there going to be marketing, advertising technology? And this is when you want to basically talk about what your, what the money is going to be used for, right? So you're going to say, this is the growth I can achieve. This is the, these are the numbers I can hit with the money you give me, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z things. So, so what you want to add into the financial model, and maybe I should add another slide, uh, another section to this is to say, this is what we're actually going to do with your money. So in order for us to achieve our uh, sales of this, I need to hire this person. I need to engage with this design agency or this agency. Um, I need to set up an office X, y, and Z, like in the X and Y and Z place. And it's going to, these are how the, all the costs are going to work. This is the costs over time. And this is how much money we're going to have. And if it, if it's going to make a loss, it's going to make a loss, right? Everyone will understand that, that it's not, uh, you know, your model's never going to be perfect. You're never going to hit every single milestone that you, that, that you assume that you are. But what they will want to know is what happens if you don't hit your targets. So what will happen if you don't actually achieve your first year's money? And one of the key things really here is, and a lot of investors will look at because they don't want to be diluted is what's your cash burn, right? When are you going to run out of money? Because the last thing that you want is for an investor to go through his due diligence, 
well, they won't even they won't even go through the due diligence. But the, to look at your pitch deck and say, well, you're going to run out of money in six months' time, and you're going to have to go and raise another set of cash. It's fine for the really early rounds, like maybe an angel round. Um, but for later rounds, you want to show that their money is going to be put to work, and then you're not going to have to go back to them for a, for a decent amount of time, for a year, two years. You're not like a, a couple of years at least. You're not going to have to go back to them for money, and by then you should have other sources of of raising additional income because no one wants to be diluted in their investment. There are obviously some that are going to know that they, uh, everyone will know that they will be diluted and some will want to exit early, but ideally you want to make sure that dilution as an investor is as, as low as possible. And if the business can survive with a good set of funds early on, and you can show that you've got a good growth model and a good uh, go to market strategy and, and the market is there, then you want to have fewer investors in your, in each of your rounds. Right? So I think here it, just to recap on the financial model, you want to show that you're on top of your numbers. You know your key earnings and um, profits. You know what you, where that money is going to go. If you've got a uh, if you've got a set of investors already, it's well worth putting down what your cap table looks like. Uh, if it's essentially, hopefully at this early stage, it's clean. If it's complicated, then that may not be something that you want to put put into a pitch deck because very complicated um, cap tables can be a turnoff. So if there's lots of very small investors, uh, that may be a turnoff for um, for investors simply because they it, it gets harder further down the line when you want to uh, getting people out and making decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, towards the end of it, what you really want to talk about and we'll go from the team and what what you what you've accomplished so far. So pretty much most investors I know invest in in obviously the the idea that they understand that the bit they understand the you know that the business is something that's valuable but they really invest in the team because if you're giving your money you're not giving your money to a faceless organization you're giving your money to a set of individuals that are sitting across the table from you and you've got to trust that these people up to this point in this presentation have thought about their business and how it's going to work and what's going to happen when it goes wrong but i also want to know what you've done now one of the big issues that i see with when people put their team in if they just slap down a lot of um, acronyms and initials and PhDs, this, and, you know, they put down all of the awards and whatever things that they've won. Uh, no one really cares about that, right? Because ultimately it's a business. You, as you guys all know, running a business is the greatest leveler on the planet because once you, you may be in a great academic, maybe top in your career, as soon as you start running a business, the gloves are off. Everything becomes very, very different. So if you're already a person who's run a business before, so, so Ryan, if you run a, you know, a successful businesses before you need to say that uh, and you need to show that you've got a pedigree and then you have to show that you understand exactly what you, uh, that you know about the business. And if there are certain skills that you don't necessarily have, you've complemented that within the team. So they don't have to be hires. They can just be advisors and you should also put your advisors down. Right. Uh, so you should show that the people that you've built around you, to help you are a successful unit that has done this before, hopefully, if um, you can find them, but will be a safe pair of hands for any money that's given to them. So we're not expecting you all to go out and buy your Lamborghinis and go crazy and um, take, a, take your, your, your holidays in the Maldives with, with the cash, right? We know that you're gonna work and fight for it. And again, going back to the financial model, if you show that, you know, how much money you've put in, your sweat equity, what, you, what you've done, if you can show that, you know, you've you've put something, you know, you've sacrificed yourself. That helps a lot because most of the uh, investors I've met on, and I've talked to uh, on both sides of the pond, you know, for them, a great team with a poor idea is better than a, a great idea with a poor team because it all comes to execution and it all comes down to what happens if something goes wrong. Are you going to panic? Are you going to seek advice? You know, what kind of leaders will you become? What kind of people will you be in a time of crisis? Because it, you know, as you guys know, it doesn't go right every day of the week uh, with, a, with, a, with a startup. So the people who are involved in it are the most important people. So, um, going up, you know, so one of the key things again is uh, around demonstrating what your achievements have been. So you, you'll have talked about who you are and what you've done. Then what have you done together collectively? Now, it may well, you may well be that you might feel that you haven't really done very much, but actually, if you think about it, there will be. So you're, you're, for you guys in particular, you're on the pre-accelerator. You, you'll have, um, maybe you've signed some deals. Uh, you'll have been in the news. You've got some PR. 
whatever it is, anything that's good news, put it in. And anything that you've achieved, if you've achieved any sales, if you've achieved any, um, you know, uh, letters of intent or anything like that, that's there that you've done show, show that and, and try and show it in a way that shows the speed of your movement. Right. So if it's something that you've been doing over two years and you've got lots of different things that you've achieved in those two years, just put them down. Right. I mean, don't go back too far, but show what you feel is the most relevant and up to date information about the company. And if you've been out there, been interviewed, then, then talk about it, right? People will Google it and they'll, they'll look and they'll look you up and they'll, they'll understand that, okay, you've been active and you've been doing stuff rather than sitting on your hands, waiting for someone to give you some money. Then of course it's the roadmap. So the final thing that by now, what you should have done is you should have set the scene of your story, your vision. Everyone should know what the problem is, uh, what, where, how you're going to go to market and exactly what you're going to do with the money that's going to be given to you. And then at the very kind of last step is right. Okay. Po post all of this. And we, under, you know, we've achieved, you've achieved something in your, in your company. What is the roadmap, right? What is the vision for the next X number of years? So maybe I would, I would normally do one to two years uh, because businesses change quite a lot uh, in the first three years of their existence. Right. So I would put in, you know, what well, are there any key milestones that you've got coming up now that you need to hit? Uh, so are there any immediate things that are coming up in the next six to 12 months? Are there any big opportunities within your market? Are there any big events that you need to be at? Um, are there any kind of big presentations that you're giving anything that can really show the case, what you've been, what you've been up to. And then, you know, within your solution itself, what are the key features and products? What are the, what's the new functionality that you're putting in? How are you enhancing what's going on? Just talk about, you know, the, the, the future execution of vision because you will be you'll already be on this roadmap right you'll already be on this trajectory so it shouldn't be too difficult for you to say okay yeah we're on this road we need your money now and it'll take us uh it'll help us go from a to z much much quicker but we're already on a path to get there within six months you're just going to turbo charge us and get there us there in three months and if you've got and i say i've, I've put in any moonshots but and i'm i'm being a little bit uh facetious there but you know if you do have really big ideas then there's no reason why you can't talk about them because here at the, at the very end and if they've got this far then they're really interested and then they want to know what is your potential what are you doing with the exit um I, what i've said there really is i put a big asterisk around it because i don't think you necessarily need to put in an exit onto your uh, like how you're gonna how everyone's gonna exit i've seen it on a number of uh, pitch decks that have been sent to me. I think that any investor will have his own idea of how he wants to exit. So I don't think you should put it in, but some people do. I haven't seen any strong, um, any strong feelings as to whether you should or shouldn't. I personally haven't. And I, and I always think exit is an imaginary thing, right? Because generally when you're investing in startups at the early stage, who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of years. So exit is, you know, that there will be an exit. People will ask you about how the, how you think they can cash out. Uh, but if you tell them it, it'll be something they can question you on. And, and you know, you're not going to have any more firm answers for that. So has anyone got any kind of questions or any of that? Before I move on to this. Nope. Okay, cool. So, uh, I mean, this list is probably self-explanatory, right? So I guess really the, the biggest, I guess, pet hate that I've got, right, are around really, it's just the way it looks. If it looks terrible, I don't really want it and I don't want to see it, then I'm not really going to enjoy reading it. I don't really want to read it, right? Uh, and if it's full of errors, spelling mistakes, then I'm just going to wonder if this is how you present something to me, how do you run your day-to-day -day business, right? It, it, I'm not going to really... I'm not going to pay attention if you can't even pay attention to me. You can't present me with something that is spell checked or um, looks good. I haven't even spent any money on, on, on getting a designer in. Why should I really spend any money on you? It doesn't make any sense. Another thing is people assuming that you understand what they're talking about when they write a lot of acronyms in, right? So as I mentioned at the very beginning, you've got to explain this like I'm a child uh, because a, I think it, well, a, it helps me quickly absorb the information, but it also helps you guys understand how do you explain this to someone else? How will you, how can, if you pick a person off the street and explain what you're doing, how can you explain it in a way that is easy for them to, to digest? Uh, and, and if you can make 
if you can make it that easy to digest, then you can tell way more people and your word spreads much quicker. If I can summarize what you do in a sentence after reading this, then that means that the next conversation I have with someone, oh, well, yeah, I've met X and Z person, or this guy sent me a pitch deck, it's great. And I can explain it in two, two sentences. You're onto a winner there, right? Uh, a lot of people also kind of are, um, they get, they put into the pitch deck a lot of, they, they make it, they gear it to what they are interested in. So there's a, there's a couple of things I put in here, which is don't assume that the investor gets excited about the same things you do and um, not explaining the problem solution clearly. I've had, a, especially from technical people, I get pitch decks which show me things like architecture diagrams and they show me that how they're doing this wonderful piece of tech, like building this wonderful piece of technology and they go really, really deeply into that, into that technology or they'll start using jargon or acronyms or terminology that isn't easy to understand. It's great if you're, a, if you're in technology or in data science or ML, but not if you're, if you're not, if you've, you've not you know, lived and breathed that um, industry or that, or that technology or sector or whatever it is. And I think that's, the problem there is that you then focus on the one thing that you like and the one thing that you're good at, and you're not really focusing on the rest of the business, right? Because really that's the key is that, yes, we know that you can design and architect and build this great app, but an app is not a business, right? I need to know that you can handle the day-to-day running of a, of a company. And to, if you're just focusing on one area of that company, then I'm a little less sure that you understand what the go-to-market strategy is, what would happen if something goes wrong and you, 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 you know, you, you're, um, cash projections are wrong or your ability to go to market in the way that you thought was wrong. So having something that is kind of geared to what you love and enjoy doesn't give me that rounded aspect of, of who you are and what you're trying to, and the message you're trying to get across. Uh, but you've got this deck, so I don't necessarily need to go into, um, into these bits in, in more detail, but if anyone got any questions on that. Oh. So before I get into the resources, I mean, the resources you can see, I will like to show you, um, right, so you can see my screen again, right? So just say thumbs up. You can see the presentation. Yep, okay, cool. So this is probably one of the worst pitch decks I've ever seen. Uh, and so what I will do is just quickly go, go through this. And I'm at, okay, stop recording maybe uh, just now. Might be worthwhile. Is this the right one? All right, we're back on. So then if you, we just get rid of that. So um, this is one that we, we built out for one of our companies called Avrium. And, um, and again, so this is a, a business that helps companies uh, manage their cash flow uh, and manage their cash flow risk. So I kind of took, so this is one that I've, I've uh, done before and put in front of investors. I started off here with risk management for platforms and the SME. So really it's very clear what we do. It's an all-in-one credit commercial risk management piece. The idea being that when you're reading this, what you're seeing is that this is what we do uh, and this is what we are. This is the kind of um, benefit that we're bringing to the business early on, right? Where our vision here was to predict cash flow issues and provide tailored finance and insurance, et cetera. Then we moved into the reason why is this a problem, right? So we, it's very clear that the problem here is that 50,000 businesses fail each year because of poor cash flow management. Uh, we can break down what we did here was we're breaking down the reasons why businesses failed and um, given and gave some statistics on what money could be saved by businesses. Right. So what we're trying to set here is that here are some key issues that we found in the marketplace. Here is a monetary, just something that we could put as a, as a piece. It doesn't have to be money. It could be something else that you want to lock in as this is the value that you can create. So you're saying that average business is owed 62,000. If we can reduce that by 30,000, that will save a lot of businesses. Right. So you're, you're just pinning some issues, key issues to the, to, the, to the presentation. And then as we're talking about our mission, what we're doing is we're addressing through these three pillars, some of the things that we've said that are a problem. So credit, improving the cash flow, getting money back from investors, uh, understanding people's, people understanding their business risk and optimizing their credit control. So if you look back to what we're saying here is that 40% of SMEs didn't know that how much money they were owed. So what we're saying as one of the issues that we can face is optimizing the credit control piece of the business. So you're directly relating a problem to a solution, right? We then went into uh, our screenshots of what we, what we've built. And again, reinforcing the message here that this is, 
we took the percentage that was in the previous slide, showed them that this is how each part of our platform is actually uh, addressing this issue. And again, this is a service web app. I know you guys are more in products, but there'll be an equivalent in what you're, what you're doing. Um, and then we had a very simple business model. So it's a monthly subscription fee. We didn't, there wasn't really much else. And we had also had a um, uh, referral percentage fees at the very beginning. We talked about our story, uh, the different things that we'd, we'd achieved over the year or so. There was a few, few, fair few things that we managed to get involved with. And then we reinforced it, our, um, our problem solution with market information to say, look, the cost of chasing, we understand what the cost of chasing overdue invoices is. We know that SMEs get paid late. Here's a market size. We know how many SMEs are using the software that we're plugging into. Um, so again, saying that we know it's a problem, there is a solution, we already have that solution, and there is a significant enough market out there for us to address it, um, and that we've had some validation. So one of the things that we did was we, we went out and ensured that we talked to businesses and understood their pain points and said, is this really a problem? So again, if you, you, guys, are, you, know, you guys know it's a problem, show by some sort of research surveys that we did that we can put, we can actually say we, we surveyed X hundred companies and they told us this. So we know that this product is needed in the marketplace. So reinforce that message. Uh, we had our go to market and we've split that down into phases for Q2, 2019, um, Q1, Q2, uh, Q2, Q3 and Q4. Uh, we actually, because we'd already been to market, uh, we could talk about what we'd done. So this was in the past, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So we, we, these are the things that we'd done and these are the lessons that we'd learned. So we're showing that along the way, as we were exploring the market and as we got knocked back or any successes, we could figure out what, what were the lessons that we learned from people who have said no to us. So for example, here we, um, we were talking to accounting firms. Um, we found that accounting firms were reluctant to recommend new software to their clients uh, in a bulk, in a, in a, in a mass in a mass uh, in a mass way what they wanted to do is they wanted to talk specifically to clients on a one-to-one -one basis and then recommend solutions for them so there was no way we were ever going to get accountancy firms to fire out to all of their clients go use this software so what we uh, showed here is how we refined that and how we actually um are taking our learnings and pushing them forward for the next sets of phases right and we also uh, tried to highlight some of the issues that we felt were going to be blockers to us actually getting the traction that we needed based on the learnings that we had and based to talking to people in the market. For us, and it comes to competitors, we were pretty simple. We just did a very simple diagram here. Um, and we talked about how our revenues here, we talked about who else is raising money. So again, this is an important thing. If you know people who are raising money and they've raised money, put that into the slide so that you can see that there's active um, deals going on in that, in that market space so that investors are, investors love a good hype and they love, they love riding the wave. Uh, and we did our model. So I realized we were coming uh, down to. Yes. Unfortunately we have a hard stop at one thirty today. But yeah. So, I mean, if anyone's got any questions, you know how to reach me. One of the things I, I haven't mentioned on the slides, but I'll mention to you now is given that you're all product based companies, make sure you mention sustainability put sustainability somewhere on your slide deck, right? I haven't added it to my slide deck. I'll add it in with um, some changes. Just make sure that you have sustainability in there somewhere. Businesses that have, sorry, investors who've invested in sustainable businesses have, raised, have, have returned outsized returns than other companies. And there is a huge, huge um, push with investors at the moment now to ensure that what they're investing in is a sustainable business. Mm -hmm. So if you've got any way to prove that you're sustainable or even that you've got a roadmap for sustainability, add that into your slide deck. Okay. That would be worth it. Okay. 